The selection of an engine for any new Land Rover model requires careful consideration. It must be robust enough for demanding off-road driving, but also offer a high level of refinement to satisfy the city dweller. So, when it came to selecting a petrol engine for the Freelander, it was fortunate indeed that an engine which met all the criteria already existed within the Rover range of power units. The Proven K-Series. Work on the K-Series project originally started in 1985, the brief being to design an engine which would provide highly competitive levels of performance and economy, and which would meet all the foreseeable requirements of emission control. The engine also had to be flexible, economic to produce, and accommodate most needs for future development. 200 million pounds was invested in the development and production of the engine. Production technologies were pioneered and refined in the purpose-built engine plant. For example, the molds for cast components are filled from below instead of from above, thus allowing more intricate and critically accurate castings to be made. Modern computer-controlled machine tools and advanced robotics provide high levels of quality and ensure that design specifications are faithfully adhered to during final assembly. After four years of development, the K-Series was launched in 1989. Three engine variants were initially produced, a 1.4 with double overhead camshafts, four valves per cylinder and fuel injection and known as the K-16. Another variant was the 1.4 with a single overhead camshaft, two valves per cylinder and a carburetor. The engine range was an immediate winner, much to the surprise of the motoring media who had previously been critical of Rover Group's attempts to design power units. In fact, some of Britain's best-known specialist sports car manufacturers, Caterham, Westfield and more recently Lotus, are specifying the K-Series in their vehicles. Since its introduction in 1989, the engine has had two capacity increases. In May 1995, a 1.6 K-Series was introduced in the new Rover 400. And then later in the same year, the exciting MGF sports car was launched with a 1.8 unit. Both these engine variants of the K-Series were developed from the original design, and it's the 1.8 unit that has been selected for the Freelander. It's a 1796cc engine with twin overhead camshafts and equipped with group-firing multi-point fuel injection under the control of a MEMS 1.9 engine management system. In the Freelander installation, it develops 120 PS at 5,500 RPM and a maximum torque of 165 Newton meters at 2,750 RPM. Very impressive figures, you'll agree. So let's look at some of the K-series features which have made it the success it undoubtedly is. First, all the major castings are aluminium alloy, which makes it very much lighter than the more conventional cast iron. One disadvantage when using aluminium alloy in small engines can be a lack of tensile strength. That is, the strength of the material when being pulled rather than compressed. The Rover engineers found an ingenious solution to this problem by coming up with a revolutionary new sandwich build technique. The three components of the sandwich are the cylinder block, cylinder head, and the crankshaft main bearing ladder. Special high tensile steel bolts, which extend right through all three components and into a casting at the bottom, hold them in compression. It's the rigidity given by this sandwich compression which gives the K-Series its great strength. There are a couple of points of interest about these long through bolts. Firstly, when you take them out to remove the cylinder head, the clamping loads through the engine are relaxed. This results in a deformation at the main bearing journals. They go slightly out of round and tighten round the crankshaft. So when the bolts are slack, it's important not to turn the crankshaft unless you have to. And then to turn it no more than necessary. Otherwise, you run the risk of damaging the bearings and the crankshaft. Secondly, like any bolt, they rely on a degree of elasticity to clamp the sandwich correctly. And it is possible that if they have been used previously, they may have been overstretched and lost that elasticity. So if you've taken them out for any reason, it's important to carry out a measurement check before you reuse them. <laughs> 
Next, we'll look at the cylinder block, and in particular, at the cast iron cylinder liners. When the original K-series engine was designed, it had wet liners, sealed at the top and bottom, which allowed coolant to circulate. When the engineers first considered a 1.6-litre engine in 1991, they found that the basic wet liner design didn't allow the required increase in bore size. So they came up with an ingenious way of allowing the bores to be repositioned and the increase in size to be catered for by designing liners which are part wet and part dry. The design was christened the damp liner. The damp liner is sealed about halfway down to keep the oil and coolant apart, but there's no need for a seal at the top, so coolant can pass freely into the cylinder head. Incidentally, the damp liner design means that special liner retainers must be fitted when the cylinder head is removed. A strong five bearing crankshaft is used and instead of having conventional bearing caps, the main bearings are retained in this ladder-like casting which not only provides structural rigidity but also lowers vibration levels. Incidentally, because the block and the bearing ladder are line bored together, they're a matched pair, so it's not possible to renew one without the other. Highly accurate machining of the bearing surfaces and correct bearing selection is all important for both mains and big ends to ensure close running tolerances and the required degree of refinement. Journals are measured and graded and bearing sizes are colour coded. The pistons for the 1.8 engine are ultra light. They only weigh 308 grams each. That's about 10% lighter than the 342 gram pistons originally fitted in the 1.4, which were already considered to be light. The light piston weight means low inertia forces to enhance quietness and smoothness of running. The basic cylinder head design is common to all K16 series engines, with the exception of the variable valve control derivative used in the MGF. It's a cross flow head featuring two overhead camshafts, four valves per cylinder, and hydraulic tappets. A lot of the original cylinder head development work centred around the combustion chamber profiles and valve configurations. In contemporary two-valve combustion chambers, the incoming mixture swirls around the bore axially. The K-series engineers found they could get more efficient combustion by controlling the mixture in a barrel swirl where it swirls across the bore rather than around it. The two camshafts run in bearing journals machined directly in the cylinder head. Both are located by this one-piece carrier which incorporates the upper halves of the camshaft bearings. The carrier is line bored with the head during manufacture, so like the crankcase and bearing ladder, the two components form a matched pair. The camshafts are driven by the crankshaft via this toothed timing belt. The drive gears are clearly marked for timing purposes. The timing belt has to be changed at the recommended service intervals. And don't forget, if you're changing a belt, never turn the crankshaft when the belt is off. The pistons will contact the valves. Now a word about lubrication. The oil pump is an eccentric rotor type driven by the nose of the crankshaft. From the full flow oil filter, the oil goes in two directions. Most is passed to an oil gallery which runs the length of the engine via the oil feed rail located under the crankshaft bearing ladder. Incidentally, the oil feed rail is the casting which acts as the clamping plate into which the cylinder head bolts are secured. From the feed rail, the oil is directed through drillings to the five main bearings, which in turn supply the big ends. The small ends and piston bores are splash fed. A smaller proportion of the oil is forced up a drilling through the block and cylinder head into the camshaft carrier, and from there to longitudinal drillings direct pressurised oil to each camshaft journal and hydraulic tappet. The camshaft lobes are spray fed. Oil from the cylinder head returns to the sump down the oversized holes provided for the cylinder head bolts. These same bolt holes are used for crankcase breathing. The transverse engine is inclined forward by 12 degrees and the oil drains back to the sump through the front five holes, while crankcase fumes rise into the camshaft cover through the rear five holes. From the cover, 
pipes carry the fumes to the throttle body for recirculation into the combustion chambers. Next, we'll look at the cooling system. The water pump is driven by the timing belt and the thermostat housing is located directly behind the pump. The water elbow at the rear of the head feeds the radiator via the top hose and the heater via a bypass hose. It also houses coolant temperature senders for the ECM and the coolant temperature gauge. Here you can see the positions of the radiator, the heater, the expansion tank and the interconnecting pipes to the engine. The water pump forces coolant through the block, cylinder head and outlet elbow. The coolant is cooled as it travels across the radiator, then out through the bottom hose and back to the engine via the coolant rail and bottom mounted thermostat. The bypass coolant from the heater returns to the engine via the thermostat. When the thermostat is closed during cold start and warm up, it cuts off the return flow from the radiator so the coolant can't circulate through it. But it does circulate through the heater via the bypass hose. Incidentally, you'll notice that the inlet manifold is a plastic injection molding. It keeps the cost and weight down and ensures repeatable quality in manufacture. Now the fuel system. In the Freelander, the fuel pump, filter and pressure regulator are housed in the fuel tank in a single unit called the fuel module. A single continuous pipe feeds fuel to the engine bay, connecting to the quick fit connector at the end of the fuel rail. The rail distributes fuel to the four injectors. At first sight, this might look like a pressure regulator. However, it's in fact a pressure damper and doesn't regulate pressure in any way. Its only purpose is to minimize pressure fluctuations. There is no fuel return to the tank and hence the system is known as returnless. The injectors are activated in a group strategy. That means they are activated in pairs. Injector number one is paired with number four, and number two is paired with number three. The precise injector opening time is electronically controlled by the engine management system, which we'll examine next. In the final part of this program, we'll look at the engine management system, the system which controls ignition, and fueling. At its heart is the MEMS 1.9 engine control module. The ECM receives information from a number of sensors located around the engine, which it analyzes and uses to determine the correct ignition timing and injection timing and duration. Let's see where these sensors are and what they do. This crankshaft sensor supplies information to the ECU relating to the speed and position of the crankshaft. This is the engine coolant temperature sensor. And this sensor in the inlet manifold measures the inlet air temperature. Manifold vacuum is sensed by this pipe which connects to a pressure transducer inside the ECM. This oxygen sensor in the exhaust manifold supplies information relating to the air fuel ratio. An idle air control valve is fitted in the inlet side of the throttle body. It allows air to bypass the throttle valve, which is almost fully closed at idle. The position of the idle air control valve is adjusted by a stepper motor under the control of the ECM. Its position determines the amount of air bypassing the valve and therefore the idle speed. The K-series engine in the Freelander uses a conventional ignition system with an ignition coil and distributor mounted high on the cylinder head away from possible water ingress. Spark timing is controlled by the ECM to provide the correct ignition advance or retard when it's needed. Of course, all this sophisticated electronics requires sophisticated diagnostic equipment if a problem occurs. So, test book is a must when you're working on the system. Finally, a word about servicing requirements. There are the usual oil and filter changes, and as we said before, the timing belt must be inspected or renewed at the recommended intervals. Double platinum spark plugs are specified and give a greatly increased service life. That completes this introductory program on the K-Series engine. 
As we said earlier, its sophistication, robustness and proven reliability makes it an ideal engine to power the Freelander into the millennium.